The rest of the story with John the Baptist as we move into that Word of God. Um, John was very clear. I'll just tell you what was going on. He's out in the Jordan River, and he's baptizing people. People are coming to him, and they are repenting of their sins, okay? And they're getting baptized, all right? And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees show up, and these are the church folks, if you will. They're religious people. Not bad, not evil, but they needed to get their act together. And John looked at the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he said something that really endeared himself to them forever when he looked at them and said, you are a bunch of snakes. <laughs> you are a brood of vipers. You folks need to produce fruit, produce fruit actions in keeping with your repentance. And then John went on to say, I'm just baptizing you with water, but there is one who's going to come after me who will baptize you with water and the Holy Spirit. And John said, I'm not even fit to carry his sandals. John was on mission. Most importantly, he was calling people to change their life. And I know that's uncomfortable for most of us. But understand, that's what John was saying way back then and what he's saying now. You need to change. And for, a, for people who have cluttered lives, for people who have busy tables, this is a, here's a maxim for all of us. If you don't like what you're getting... Right? Well, if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep what? Getting what you're getting. So if you want something to be different in your life, you have to change something. And what we deal with here, what we deal with here in the church is we always point back to what John's saying. Your life needs to be different, so you need to repent. You need to turn from what you're doing that's keeping you from God and turn towards God. You need to turn from this and find Christ in new ways this year. In the last two weeks, um, I think this message is necessitated by the conversations I've had with people over the last couple of weeks. I've been listening to my sheep, right, if you will, you know, uh, the folks in my church, the people that I am sent to serve and love and care for. I've been listening to so many of you talk about how your lives are so cluttered right now with busyness. Fair enough. I said, okay, well, we better talk about that, right? And see what we can do about that. I've been listening to you all talk about this month of December. I mean, like 11 months out of the year, it's busy enough, right? 11 months out of the year, I mean, pick a month, it's busy enough. Then you add December to it and you add all the new stuff and all the other things into December, like places to be and uh, um, places you've got to show up to. And then it snows nine inches and the preacher's crazy and thinks it's wonderful, but you think it's horrible, right? Stressful enough. December shows up, and, and 11 months out of the year, it's busy, but it's December shows up, and we've got places to go, and we have demands placed upon us that maybe we don't always have those other months. We have demands um, uh, of, of things that we should do and things that we should say. There are expectations during December, expectations that others have of us or that we have of ourselves that aren't there the other 11 months. There are expectations um, that we get the right gift, the perfect gift, that we be happy, that we be cheerful, that we be grateful. Has anybody here seen that classic, wonderful, philosophical movie called A Christmas Vacation with Chevy Chase? Anybody seen that? That whole movie is based on what I'm talking about and what you see up on the screen, expectations, right? Right? Clark Griswold has these ridiculous, crazy expectations of himself and his family and everybody else right down to that all the lights are going to come on when he hits the button, right? That's the point of the whole movie is that expectations get really out of whack during December and they mess us up, that our expectations clutter our lives. And the expectations other have, others have upon us, it, it, it makes it tough. There's the, there's the pressure. There's the pressure to do the perfect thing, to have the just right dish, to get the perfect present. Today, um, this afternoon, all of the church staff are coming to my house, right? And I realize that the pressure they're under to make the perfect dessert to bring to my house has been driving some of them nuts. I, a woman walked into the church this morning with this really fancy bowl and brought it to Kim. And I'm like, what is that all about? Sue Miller always brings the water for baptism. What are we doing, Kim? No, it's got to have a special bowl for the cherry trifle. Is that what it's called? Trifle to take to the pastor's house. Talk about pressure. Kim is about ready to crack, right? <laughs> nah, she's good. 
and it'll be the best cherry trifle effort. Be well assured of that. It'll be the first. Well, okay. So there's no pressure is my point. I mean, just as long as somebody brings green bean casserole and it's the best I've ever had, just, you know, do that. The point is pressure, folks. It ramps up during December. It just does. It ramps up during December, and our lives look like this, and it's stacked up with not necessarily bad stuff, but just a lot of stuff. Amen? It's just stacked up, and we're like, man, I don't know, and I don't know if you're feeling it, but I'm feeling it. Anybody else feeling this way? Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk more about this. Because, see, what's added to our busy table with all the demands and expectations and pressures that come with December, um, what comes with that is that this is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. We're supposed to be full of joy, full of happiness, full of goodwill. We are supposed to be um, somehow, some way it's being imparted to us that we're supposed to be experiencing joy right now. And for many people, joy has been sucked right out of their life and living. Yes? That further complicates this. And as I've been saying all morning, you know, December is supposed to be the time for joy and hope and serenity and love and thankfulness and peacefulness. But, um, you know, it, it's just hard to fit it in on the table. So maybe if this is the way Decembers are going to go, I think I'll trade December for two Februaries, Right? If that's possible with, you know, God, the great baseball manager in the sky, I'll take two Februarys and April, or I'll take half a month. Anyway, sometimes I just feel like this is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year, and I'm wiped out and ready to crash. Amen? So we've got to talk about it some more and do something about it. See, I think I read this story this week, and I thought, well, sadly, I think here's a story that illustrates what's really going on spiritually, you know? Because we can talk about schedule-wise and bank accounts and calendars, you know, checkbooks and date books, all we want. But now we're talking about spiritually. See, we lose something. We miss something. I read a story this week about a family that uh, uh, had their baby baptized, and they made, a, they made a big deal about it, as they should. They had their baby baptized. And so um, they invited people to come to worship to the church celebration and family and friends and neighbors. And then after worship was over, everybody went to their house um, for a big party, right, as it should be. Lots of good food, lots of good drink. They even wore little hats on their heads, huh? That's a party. They, everybody went to their house for a big party um, to celebrate this child's baptism. And after about two hours of the party, somebody says, say, where's the baby, right? Where's the guest of honor? Shouldn't we, you know, be seeing this little baby? And so everybody stopped partying and they begin to look. And finally, they found the baby upstairs under all of the coats that people had piled on top of the bed and the baby had suffocated. Yeah. So this is real life and it's tragic. I'm not making light of it. When I said to you, church, that the danger of this, the danger of this is the spiritual toll it takes on us. More specifically, that we miss the baby. It's, it's partly this. It's partly that theme, that message. It's not your birthday. It's not my birthday. It's his birthday. And we're invited to it. We're, we're supposed to be celebrating the baby, Jesus. But the danger that we run into spiritually is that our lives become so cluttered and become such a mess that we start to make dumb decisions and wrong decisions and we get cloudy and we get fuzzy and spiritually, we miss the baby. Spiritually, spiritually, we lose Jesus in December. Now imagine that. Imagine that. It's His birthday, His month, His season. And we've lost Him. We've forgotten about Him. Don't know where He is. Praise God and thank God we'll never lose him because he's, you know, resurrection. You can't kill him. Amen. But we miss him out of our homes and out of our heads and out of our lives if we're that busy. That's why this week I thought about the person in the Bible that maybe we identify the most with. Maybe the person in Scripture that during December we need to make sure we are not this person. And I'm talking about the innkeeper, right? Right? Talking about the innkeeper. Remember that role in the Christmas drama? Anybody be the, were you the innkeeper in your Christmas drama? Anybody? Or did you get stuck with the tinfoil halo and the bathrobes, right, for shepherds? 
innkeeper. Innkeeper was a small part that was given to the kid that um, was shy, right? Or, or the kid um, that didn't really want to be there, but his mom made him be there, right? And that kid came out and said, there's no room, right? And he was done. No room at the end. All right, thank you very much. Um, exit stage left. The innkeeper is who we should identify with. The innkeeper is who we are identifying with. See, the innkeeper, when you read about the innkeeper in the Christmas story, and I didn't, I didn't even have to read that scripture because you all know that scripture. You all know that story, right? We identify with the innkeeper because he wasn't bad. He wasn't, he wasn't evil. He wasn't stupid. You know what he was? He was, he was busy. He was busy. That's what was going on in that scripture. And that's where we, where, where we are found. Notice my construction of that. Not that we find that scripture. That scripture finds us where we live, where we live. And it says busy. And let's look at that for a moment because the innkeeper, the innkeeper was busy. Everybody and their dog was coming to the city of David because the IRS said they had to go to the city of their birth to sign up on one of those health care exchanges. No, that's modern day. Let me back up. The Roman officials said that everybody needed to go to the city of their birth, the city of David, and register for a census so that they could better tax them. That really was going on. And so here's the innkeeper. He's got his house. It's probably a house and uh, not that many rooms. And everybody and their dog, everybody's coming to Bethlehem. And guess what? Everybody wants a room. And everybody wants a meal. And everybody wants a place to stay. And everybody wants a place to put their animals. Everybody wants something. And he's busy. And here comes this young kid. Here comes this young guy, barely shaven. You know, peach fuzz on his face. And he's got this, this woman that's like pregnant, right? Big time pregnant. Little Jewish girl, Mary. And he says, I need a room. And the innkeeper's like, yeah, right. I'm too busy to deal with you is how I imagine it. And, and, and I think the innkeeper was so busy, I think, that even if Joseph would have said, no, listen, bud, I don't think you get it. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, the Messiah is about to be born in your house today. Give us a room. I don't think the innkeeper would have heard him. And so here's the point, first point. The innkeeper missed it. He missed it. Had a chance, had a shot. He missed it. By the grace of God, he gave him a cave out back. You guys, cave, at least it's a roof over your head or back in there. He gave him the animal barn, right? He couldn't make room. And I say again, of all the people of Scripture, during December, maybe this is the person we can identify with the most because it finds us, the innkeepers who can't find time for the baby to be born, reborn, show up and live at your house. Because of the way we live. Now, here's the good news, because we're going to shift. We're going to make the transition. Here's the good news. Yes, I'm busy. Yep. And our problem could be, our problem could be, like the innkeepers, that we miss it, right? That we leave Jesus out. But no. See, a couple of things are going on. We know the significance of this baby born in Bethlehem, don't we? Yes? We know the significance of baby Jesus. We know. We've seen the Christmas drama with the, the bathrobe shepherds and the tinfoil halo uh, angels. We've seen the story. We know it. We've even been there for the Easter drama. We've been there. Even if those are the only two times a year that we show up in church, we at least know that part of the story. Amen? We know the significance of this baby. So that's helpful, right? And we also know this, and if you don't know this, then I want you to hear this so that you do know it today. The good news is that God specifically, and God very intentionally came into this. Don't miss that. That God very intentionally and very deliberately came into a messy, cluttered world to save you. Don't miss that. That God showed up in the mess. Think about that first Christmas, you know. The details of that first Christmas. Yes, the young man Joseph. Yes, the teenage girl Mary, pregnant, traveling, traveling, probably on a donkey or walking. Sound fun to anybody? The details of the first Christmas. Is it, it was some hard work and it, it was busy. As I said, everybody and their relatives that were from the city of David were there. It's hectic. It's chaos. And it's, it's, they, they got put into a barn, into a stinking barn. It wasn't the, 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 the um, a birthing suite at Mercy Hospital. Are you with me? You know, there was, wasn't even a midwife there probably. Those are details of the first Christmas. It was stinking. It was messy. No joking. I'm not joking here, but childbirth is messy. 
Imagine it in a barn. Imagine the noise. Imagine the pain. Imagine the screaming. Imagine the blood and all the other stuff that comes out. That's part of the first Christmas. And it doesn't show up in the cool little sterile hallmark ornament nativity scene. I get it. But don't miss it. First Christmas had a mess. First Christmas had chaos. First Christmas had noise and uncertainty. And so get it. That's what God shows up in. You with me? Oh, thank you, God. And I really hope that you get there and that you see that. Thank you, God, for showing up in the middle of this. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus into this. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to be in the midst of my mess. See, I think that's good news. I think that's great news. I think if you don't hold on to any other piece of news this year or next year, hold on to this. Is it by the grace and mercy of our God and because God loves you, and because God wants to redeem you and change your life, that God sent Jesus into the mess, that God sent Jesus into our messy tables, and we, I get it, we don't always see him. We don't always see him because we got so much stacked up, but he's there. He's there, really, in the midst of the mess. You know, some people mistakenly think that God only shows up at the Better Homes and Garden table. Some people mistakenly believe that God's only going to show up and be present when you get your act together, right? And isn't it funny how we tend to not ever get our act together until like the doctor tells us we have six months to live or we have a heart attack and are in the emergency room. You know what I'm talking about? So here's the point. Jesus came to help us get our act together. Amen? Some people mistakenly think that God's only going to show up if we dress the right way and speak the right language and do the right things, the right kinds of backflips down the center aisle or whatever it may be, that we got everything in its place, like the Better Homes and Garden, Ladies' Journal, whatever they take pictures of tables for. I don't know, they put it on Pinterest or something. No. Don't they? <laughs> the point is, the point is, no, don't make that mistake. The point is that, is that Jesus started here in the mess. Why? Because this is where we live. Y'all still with me? Especially in December. This is where we live. So, we, so here's where we're going, folks. That's the good news. That's the awesome, great news that I hope you hold on to. So what are we going to do about it? What we do about it is this. Is we listen first to John the Baptist. And what did he say? What did he say? Hey, basically he said, I don't want you to miss, I don't want you to miss this Jesus because you're so busy. I don't want you to miss this Jesus because you are so far turned away from God. So John said, you need to repent. You need to start clearing a path in your life. And let me tell you, that folks, that, that message also should find us. It should find each one of us who has a heartbeat in here this morning. John the Baptist said, you need to repent, and that's how we quietly, no matter what's going on in life, that's how we quietly, because for some of us we need to do it quietly, that's how we begin to change. Now, I don't know what needs to change in your life, but you do, okay? I don't know what needs to change, but you do, and I can't make your change for you. John said, repent, and so we may do this quietly with prayer. And we do it with, with worship, right? We do it with cell groups. And we start clearing a path, you know? Or maybe we need to do it more dramatically. You know what I mean? Dramatic enough for you? Not in anger. Not in anger. But maybe we need to be more deliberate and more intentional. Maybe we need to get serious about it instead of just talking about it. Instead of just writing about it on our Facebooks and texts and Pinterest uh, 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 accounts and whatever. Maybe we need to get serious about it this year. Because somehow, some way, we feel like we're living in a mess and we're missing Jesus. And the preacher's telling you, that's me, he's there. Clear a path. Make way so that you can experience this Jesus this year. Don't wait. Why are you going to wait until you're in the dark? Why are you going to wait until life stinks. Why are you going to wait till you're in the emergency room? 
What do you need to do to clear a path today so that Jesus is more visible in your life, in your head, in your home, in your heart? What are you going to do so Jesus shows up in what you do with your hands? That's our challenge, folks. But it's also the good news. And today we're going to celebrate communion as a way to reinforce that good news. That this message that God has come into your mess to save you, to redeem you, to give you hope. That's a message for everybody that has a heartbeat. And I think probably that's all of you and me. So let's pray about that right now. I invite you to be in that attitude. Lord God, I pray that you give us the courage to name our mess. I pray that you give us the courage to tell you exactly what it is that we need help with. Help us do that right now, Lord. Help us to form the right words in our mind to tell you. Thank you, Lord God, for listening to that. And Lord, now hear us as we confess our sins to you. As we privately, quietly tell you what it is, Lord, that we need to turn away from and that we need your help. We need your strength to turn away from it, Lord God, and mostly we need your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord God. And I pray that you write it upon our hearts that we are your forgiven people. Lord God, write it upon our hearts. Let it burn within us that we belong to you and that you don't, you don't want us to live in a mess. You don't want us to live cluttered, cluttered lives. So Lord God, last thing today, please infuse us with hope. Hope that tomorrow will be different than today. Infuse us with hope, Lord, in Jesus' name. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray together the prayer that Jesus told us to pray as we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.